Hello, everyone. My name is Philippe. I'm with the Charter for Compassion. We are about to begin our panel, um, Golden Rule and Compassion for All Animals. We are about to set up to go live on Facebook, and then the conversation will begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and happy Golden Rule Day. I'm Lisa Levinson, the co-founder of In Defense of Animals Interfaith Vegan Coalition, with 40-plus coalition members, partners, and allies. We're honored to be part of uh, this event and especially as Compassion for all, all Animals Partners with the Charter for Compassion. The Golden Rule celebrates the interconnectedness of people, animals, and the earth while fostering the rights and freedoms of all. We're delighted to speak about Compassion for All Animals today. We will share our top Golden Rule gems our lessons, inspirations, and takeaways. So it's my pleasure to begin with one of our organizations, A Prayer for Compassion Film, and with Thomas Wade Jackson, who is representing this organization, and he is the founder of The Compassion Project, which is a multimedia production company and the director of the award-winning feature-length doc documentary, A Prayer for Compassion. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Lisa. Thanks so much for hosting today. And I'd like to thank Felipe and the Charter for Compassion for uh, sponsoring this event today. This is awesome. I'm very fond of the golden rule. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I uh, made a documentary that came out in 2019 called A Prayer for Compassion, where we explore the teachings of compassion at the heart of many of today's spiritual and religious traditions. And, you know, and I came away feeling that all of these traditions have a lot more in common than they have uh, different. You know, I feel like they all uh, emphasize um, taking care of the planet, being good stewards of the planet. They all emphasize being kind to one another, to taking care of animals and uh, as well as the body temple. You know, they all have that. And the other thing they all have is almost every one of them had like their own version of the golden rule, which encourages everyone to be kind to others in the way that they, you know, to treat others the way they like to be treated. It's just, um, it's in all cultures. So, I mean, this has to be one of the most valuable teachings there is since it's showing up in all of these traditions. And I think that uh, what we're hoping, I think all of us here, here today are to encourage people to expand the golden rule, to go beyond people and to think of animals and the planet and uh, I mean, because if you really think about it, like wh what the animals go through and the food system to provide animal products, no one, uh, nobody wants to do that. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't want that done to yourself. You know, you wouldn't want to be confined and tortured and, and killed as a baby. So I feel like uh, it's a it's like a no brainer to to um, include the animals and um and, you know, and, and all of creation. And I think if you look at all of these things, like all of these things are in alignment with a vegan diet, you know, uh, being kind to all of life is, is in alignment with a vegan diet. So I feel like, I like to think that um, living a vegan lifestyle, you have three or more opportunities a day to uh, practice the golden rule. Every time you eat something, every time you, you vote with your dollar, and you buy that product that you're going to eat, and it's a, a peaceful product, and it's a product that was made hopefully locally and organically, you know, and you're you're taking care of yourself, you know, you're being, uh, your your health is improving, and you're being an example for those around you. So it's, it's really like a powerful way to put the golden rule into practice every day. You know, and I think everybody here is going to say something to that nature because it's such a powerful thing. Um, the other thing I thought about when it comes to the golden rule, and it, and this came when I was thinking about, I interviewed Reverend Carol Saunders for a docu-series we're about to release called Compassion in Action, Bringing the Elixir Home. And she said this thing that has kind of stuck with me. She mentioned that the idea of the golden rule, um, treat others as you'd like to be treated, is implying that you're treating yourself well, that you have self-dignity, self-love, self-compassion, and that, you know, you're, that you're doing all these things for yourself, you're taking care of yourself, you know, because, you know, I mean, honestly, the way most of us talk to ourselves in our head, we wouldn't want to talk to another person like that. If we put the golden rule into practice and do what we do unto ourselves, like, 
We won't want to do that. So we, I think it's important that we apply the golden rule to ourselves, expand it big enough to include all of creation and then include ourselves and to take care of ourselves. Uh, I interviewed Rich Roll uh, for the docu-series and he said something to the extent of, it's not selfish to take care of yourself. It's like putting an insurance policy out so that when the time is right and you're called to do that action that you're here to take, that you're at your best self and you're ready to take that. So I, I just want to encourage people to take good care of themselves. And the other thing I thought about was the, expanding the golden rule out to uh, future generations. You know, so many times we don't really stop to think about the actions we're taking and how that's going to affect the, the children and the animals and the people that are coming after us. And I think it's important on this golden rule day that we we expand this golden rule to include all of creation. And um, so I just want to close by reemphasizing the fact that, you know, I think it's important that we uh, take care of ourselves. I think that um, w that the golden rule is something that is we can practice and we can put into practice every day. And when you include yourself, you know, that's thousands of times a day of self kind talk and, and all of these things. So uh, I'm so grateful to be here and I look really forward to hearing what the other panel members say and just thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you, Thomas, so much for your incredible work in the world with your documentaries and for your gem that you just shared with us today. So next up, we have the Animal Interfaith Alliance, and Barbara Gardner is the founder and CEO of this wonderful group, the Animal Interfaith Alliance, which is an alliance of faith-based animal advocacy organizations. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Um, well, at the Animal Interfaith Alliance, we don't just recognize that the golden rule to treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself is common amongst all faiths and traditions and dates back for millennia. But we also recognize that all faiths and traditions have included animals in their definition of others in the golden rule. Sadly, many of the followers of those faiths and traditions today and for hundreds of years in the past, have forgotten that the rule applies to all sentient beings, beings who can feel pain and suffer and who can experience pleasure and happiness. In our ever more human-centric world, animals have become excluded from our circle of compassion. They've become reduced to mere commodities for our use with little or no regard for their complex emotional, social and spiritual lives. At the Animal Interfaith Alliance, we aim to educate people on the original teachings of their faiths and to reinstate the fundamental principle that we must extend our circle of compassion to include all conscious, sentient beings, and that we must extend to them also the golden rule and treat them as we would wish to be treated ourselves. Our vision is for a peaceful world where people of all faiths and none work together to treat animals with respect and compassion. Our mission is to create a united voice for animals from all of the major faiths to bring about that world. And we do this by bringing together diverse faith-based animal advocacy organizations to be a strong voice for animals. We educate through the school RE syllabus, we campaign against cruelties and abuses of animals, and we aim to put animals on the agendas of major institutions. We believe in a vegan lifestyle which does not harm others. Animals are sentient beings who have the right to live freely and not to be made to suffer by humans. They exist for their own sakes and not for ours. Animals are emotional beings who can love us and provide companionship and can be members of our families and communities. We are part of an interconnected web which includes the earth and all its inhabitants, both plant and animals. By abusing part of that web, 
we damage the rest of it, including the environment and ourselves. The book of Genesis is the foundation of the major Abrahamic faiths and their offshoots. In it, God gave humans stewardship over a garden of Eden, a heaven on earth where they would live in harmony with all other creatures. He provided a plant-based diet to enable that harmony. How far have we deviated from this? How much damage have we caused to that garden and its inhabitants? And how much pain and suffering is the world experiencing because of it? We must get back to that Eden, and we can only do this by extending the golden rule to all of its inhabitants. In the Dharmapada, Buddha said, all your fellow creatures are like you. They want to be happy. Never harm them. And when you leave this life, you too will find happiness. Thank you for listening. Go well. Thank you for that wonderful quote <laughs> and also for your work with your organization. We truly appreciate it. <clears throat> the Animal Interfaith Alliance is one of our partner organizations. And next up, we've got the Circle of Compassion and we have Dr. Will Tuttle representing this organization. He is an award-winning visionary author of the international bestseller, the World Peace Diet. He presents globally and is a pianist, composer, and Dharma master in the Zen tradition. I will. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Yes, uh, this is really uh, very important to have this conversation. So thanks, everyone, for your contributions. Thank you, uh, everyone. And so I think uh, the Circle of Compassion was started by Madeline and myself and Judy Carmen in order to bring the spiritual dimension into the vegan movement in the sense of combining a direct uh, use of our consciousness as well as activism in the world in order to create a field of awareness that would support compassion for animals. And the basic idea really underlying everything, obviously, I think for all of us is that we're born into a society where from the time we're little infants, we're taught to treat humans somewhat with respect. I mean, that's at least in the traditions, but animals, especially in the, the three Abrahamic traditions, are pretty much considered as uh, objects to be used. Thou shalt not kill means humans, for, for the most part, in most of the, the ways people are interpreting that. And in the Eastern traditions, it's interesting because they, those traditions emerged, I think, in cultures that were less dominated by the herding of animals. And so when we say not to kill, it means all sentient beings. That's kind of understood. And so I've been very blessed, I think, really, uh, that the World Peace Diet has been translated into so many languages and we've been able to travel all over Asia and India, Eastern Asia, China, Korea, and Southeast Asia and India, as well as Africa and the Middle East uh, and Europe, and see how the different religious traditions uh, are interpreting and how they're spreading the golden rule. And I remember when we were in Chu Fu, which is a city in Northeast China where Confucius uh, lived and taught, we went to the temple there and right at the, the main thing is, he said is, do not do to others what you would not want to have done to yourself. And right after uh, visiting there, we went to a Confucian uh, village that they're actually creating that's a small city, probably with three or 4,000 people, and it's completely vegan, the entire thing. There's uh, obviously no meat, dairy, and eggs. Uh, all the agriculture is veganic with no bone meal or blood meal or fish meal or manure. And it's all laid out and really thousands of people living a completely vegan lifestyle based on the ideas of Confucianism, of kindness and respect for others, the, living the golden rule for animals, ecosystems, for children, for and for elders. And, uh, and of course, when I was in China and in these other Asian countries, uh, I was being basically paid to promote the golden rule uh, for animals and to spread the vegan message. And it was uh, just the experience of living like I did in Korea in a Zen monastery where there was no meat, dairy, or eggs out of compassion for animals, no killing of insects, 
and they had been practicing this for 750 years. And so I really had the feeling, you know, in my bones that this is really the way we are designed to be living actually as human beings that we've all been in many ways hijacked from the time of little kids away from our inherent empathy and wisdom. And that's been stolen from us in many ways by our cultural upbringing and by the way that we're forced to eat animal foods from the time of little kids and abandon actually the golden rule, which is constantly, uh, I think, this beautiful reminder of the truth uh, that's in all the world's sacred traditions. And so when I was in Korea, I realized that my mind had been colonized. And I think that's really what happens to all of us. And the infinite sky of awareness is covered over by the clouds of conditioning. And it takes quite a lot of inner work, I think, for all of us as human beings to be able to connect again with the infinite sky of our awareness and realize that there is one life that lives through all of us. And so this basic underlying wisdom of not doing to others what we would not want to have done to ourselves, and also of giving to others what we would like to have for ourselves. It's really the essence of all the world religions. And another one that goes with it, a teaching that's also within the core of all the world religions, the other main teaching really, is whatever we sow, we're going to reap. Whatever we put out will come back. So this, these two really work together, I think. And yet we're raised in a society where that's completely uh, abandoned, that basic wisdom. And we have a new religion, really, uh, that's taken over the world, a new monotheism, which is science, scientism, which really uh, offers zero uh, moral guidance at all. And in fact, in many ways, it offers the opposite. It, it kind of encourages the idea of natural selection, of might makes right, of strong dominating and exploiting the weak. And there's a powerful movement that's being rolled out, I think, uh, globally through the media and everywhere to destroy the world religions, uh, which are inconvenient, <clears throat> and um, to see them as non-essential uh, because uh, they're actually uh, ha have they actually have this wisdom that inspires us to uh, remember the empathy that is our true nature and to reconnect with that. So uh, I'm really delighted that, uh, the, that the Child for Compassion is making it a special point to connect with uh, the Golden Rule, the wisdom of the Golden Rule, and we have this opportunity to include animals in that specifically because what I discovered and, and what the World Peace Diet is all about is the basic truth that whatever we've done to animals, and it's very sobering to realize that, eventually we've done to each other, everything. It's a small step from owning them as property to force medicating them, to tracking them, to enslaving and oppressing them. And we do that by the millions every day. We sell, buy and sell them by the pound. So uh, it's really important for us, uh, given the technology we have, to start to live the golden rule in regards to animals, not only for their sake, but as everyone has said, for future generations, and to honor the spiritual wisdom that really lives as part of our human heritage and all the world religions and that each one of us in our generation to bring this teaching to the next generation, that's a, that's a very sacred uh, obligation that we all have. So I'll just close there. I want to thank everyone for the efforts you're making. And this is something that we uh, reach each one of us, I think, uh, is called to make an effort to embody the teachings of the golden rule and to live that in our daily lives. And as we do that, to make the uh, ancient wisdom teachings alive in our society so they go on to the next generation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Tuttle, for your words of wisdom. Really, really appreciate that today. You're um, welcome. <laughs> now we look forward to having um, a representative from Climate Healers. In fact, we have the the founder here, Dr. Silas Rao of Climate Healers, is a systems engineer and human earth animal liberation, which spells out the HEAL as an acronym, activist. So he's all about healing the planet. Hi, Silas. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak about this. And I'm delighted that the Charter for Compassion has included uh, animals in and you can see an animal representative here <laughs> insisting that she get attention <laughs> as we talk <laughs> about this. Uh, she, uh, 
speaking about uh, the golden rule for animals and golden rule being applicable to animals and in the context of the environment is like asking people uh, not to commit rape because you may get STDs or something like that. You know, this is what uh, uh, I heard at a rally in India when I was attending that rally. And and I see the truth of that. You know, it's, I don't want to bring an environmental angle into this because it's a moral question from the outset. But at the same time, the environmental angle gives us a timeline for when we need to make this transformation happen. As, have, and I know it is extremely urgent because of what's happening in the environment. Uh, I'm a systems engineer by profession. And when I started uh, looking into the environment, I realized that we are destroying it so fast that we need to make a transformation very, very quickly. Um, between 1970 and 2010, we wiped out 52% of all wild vertebrates on this planet, because mainly because of what we are doing to the animals. And that number became 58% by 2012. So we increased it by 3% every year. And at that rate, we were on track to hit 100% by 2026. So when that uh, report came out in 2016, I was uh, I was putting my granddaughter to bed, and uh, at the end, and I was reading her a story to put her to bed. At the end of the story, she asked me, "Grandpa, who were the first human beings?" And I have promised my granddaughter that I'll never ever lie to her. So I told her, "I'm going to explain to you how it works." how evolution works. I said, imagine that you're standing on the street and you're holding your mother by your hand and you ask your mother to bring her mother to stand by her side and so on. So you create a long line of mothers on this side of the street. And on the other side of the street, you ask a chimpanzee to do the same thing with her mother and her grandmother and so on. By the time these two lines go from Phoenix to Tucson, they will merge because both lines are going to say, hey, that's my mama too. Immediately, she just sat up in bed. She said, what? Are you telling me that animals are my family? And you know, I hadn't put it together like that. I just knew the theory of evolution and I was explaining it to her. But she immediately connected that animals are her family. And, and um, so I said to her, now that he put it that way, yeah, they are your family. She said, then, then why are people eating my family? Grandpa, make them stop They're eating my family. And I realized that I had created a world full of monsters for my granddaughter because she was naming names of people she knows who were eating her family. And my heart was being wrenched out of my chest listening to her sob. And I, so I was trying to console her. And I said, Kimaya, this is what I do. It's my job to make them stop. So please stop crying. As soon as I said that, she did stop crying. And she looked at me wide-eyed. She said, this is your job. This is your job. You know you haven't done your job. You said, do your job. When will you do your job? And I blurted out, I better do it by 2026. Otherwise, we are all in big trouble. And she said, will you promise me that? I said, okay, I'll promise you that. She said, will you give me a pinky promise? And I said, okay, I'll give you a pinky promise. And... We, she said, and I had no idea what it meant. Okay, so she said, hold out your pinky. And then she locked her pinky in mine and she said, you can never ever break a pinky promise. And then she went to sleep. And, it, and I couldn't sleep because I thought, you know, who am I to make this promise? I made a promise on behalf of all of humanity and to a little girl. And I better keep it because it's a very serious promise now. And finally, I dozed off. And the next morning, I woke up realizing that it is my job as a systems engineer to show you what would happen if it doesn't and how do you go about doing this transformation from a climate heating species to a climate healing species, from a climate heating system to a climate healing system. So that's what systems engineers do. And I realized that healing the climate is, a, is an engineering project. And there are 8 billion of us now involved in this engineering project. And it requires us to be kind to all life. And so now we have to create a system in which we are routinely kind to all life. 
And that's what I set out doing. And that's the Vegan World 2026 project. And uh, as part of that, uh, the million vegan grandmothers have written a letter to the Guardian and in which they said at the end, as grandmothers, we feel strongly that children and grandchildren deserve to live in a world where adults hold strongly to the ethics of love, cooperation, nonviolence, and peace for all beings. And that fundamentally requires a vegan lifestyle. So I've written about this. I've written 12, uh, 12 of the stories that happened with my granddaughter in this book, The Pinky Promise. So please look it up. And this constitutes the 12 steps of a transformation from a climate heating civilization to a climate healing civilization. So each chapter is plus is one step in that transformation. So with that, thank you so much, Lisa, for this opportunity. And uh, I'm glad to be here. We appreciate that story that you shared about the Pinky Promise and how important they are for, for children everywhere and for the whole planet, actually. So next, we're actually going to um, introduce uh, Vanetta Calloway, who represents two organizations uh, within our Interfaith Vegan Coalition, the Committee of Consciousness and the Black Vegan Experience. So Vanetta founded the Committee of Consciousness and the Black Vegan Experience to support BIPOC plant-based awareness, self-care, and better care of our earth. So it's wonderful to have you here today, Vanetta. Yes, hello and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I don't have myself on the screen. Is it my turn to go? Or? It is, yes. Okay. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to start with a little story about how I recall the um, golden rule. I learned about the golden rule in vacation Bible school probably, I don't know, 40 years ago. And they said, you always put on your gloves. So it's do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And so I always remember that. And it was really cool to have this invitation to come and speak to you guys today because everything that we do is a life experience that we can share. And this is exactly why God gave me the vision to share the Black Vegan Experience and Committee of Consciousness being on the back end as a nonprofit to live communities. Um, when we consider Matthew 7, 12, which is where um, we find the golden rule, um, it removes all of the prior traditions of animal sacrifice. Um, all of those things were gone, and it was all about love um, and the ultimate sacrifice um, of Christ, if you were a believer in Christianity, um, to go forward and steward the things that our creator had created, not to hurt them, not to harm each other, but to lift. And if you've ever gone to our page or seen our logo for Committee of Consciousness, it's a hand holding the world shaped in the brain because we raise consciousness, we raise awareness, we raise people and communities in order to empower them to make those informed choices about how they treat each other, how they treat themselves, how they treat our animal friends, how they treat the environment. But when you have a group um, or groups of people that have been marginalized, that have been ostracized, um, that have been oppressed, it's harder to change the frame of thought until they are cared for. And that is what we're doing. We are caring for those communities um, by removing the stereotypes that have been placed by cultural, um, societal differences um, in the process of lifting them. We are able to also lift our animal friends and let them understand that it's not just us that we're taking care of and we're preventing harm to, but them as well. You don't have to consume animals to be well, to be healthy, to feel, um, I guess, because they say the bigger the steak, the, the more you make, no. Um, the bigger your heart, I think the more you'll can be considering what's on your plate. And so again, that's what we wanna do is lift them up. My three nuggets um, were real life application. You know, So again, you know, creation was not for us, it was made for God's glory, but we were left here to steward it. That means to take care of it. Um, and then when you are a visitor somewhere, which we are, this earth does not belong to us, 
we should be leaving it better than we found it. Just like when you're visiting a hotel or Airbnb, it's not yours, you're borrowing it for just a little while, but you wanna take as best care as you can while you're in that space. And so I always like to make those real life connections um, to others and leave, you know, just a little glimpse of hope and understanding. Um, scripture always tells us that whatever we do, we do to the least of these. And so the least of these are not just children or those that were oppressed and marginalized, it's our animal friends as well. They don't have a voice to speak up. So we become their voice. Um, so we, again, we are applying all of these in our walk um, with Committee of Consciousness and in all of our vegan experiences, the Black vegan experience, the Orlando vegan experience, the North Carolina vegan experience, wherever we go, it becomes our experience that we can share these uh, different concepts of life um, and goodness that we should be able to partake in and share. Um, leaving it better than you found it. Um, and again, we are living in communities and people who have been ostracized, marginalized, um, oppressed to change their frame of thought, to get them thinking on a more conscious level. But when people are not well in thought, mind and body, and you help them by transitioning to the vegan lifestyle, then there is healing that takes place in their heart in their mind and their spirit, so that therefore they do feel that connectedness to our animal friends, to our planet, to each other. Um, and those barriers that were there in place in the past have now faded away and we can move forward together. Um, we want to never withhold anything good that we can do in our power, because it's, it's, it's biblical, it's what the right thing to do. And it, it always goes back to relationship. So if we can build relationship with each other, then we can teach them how to build relationship with things that they never had before. Like why I should recycle? Why should I care? Why should I not eat animals? Why should I consume plants? And, and again, this is all what we're doing is just raising awareness, helping people to form um, the good choices connected to um, the golden rule. So again, thank you for allowing me to share. Um, it's always a pleasure to just be a servant, whether it's using your words, your hands, or your feet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vanetta. We're so graced by your presence and all your amazing work in the world. Next up, we have the Compassion Consortium. And we have Victoria Moran who is a best-selling author, director of the Main Street Vegan Academy and co-founder of the Compassion Consortium, which is an interfaith center for animal advocates. Hello, Victoria. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Hello, Silas's cat. And uh, thanks to Philippe and uh, everyone at the Charter for Compassion. When Vanetta was speaking and talked about how the animals don't have a voice other than ours, that really spoke to me very personally and poignantly today because someone very close to me suffered a stroke on Sunday morning and the part of the body affected is the voice and the ability to form words. So my job of moral imperative is that as long as he can't form words, I need to be there to speak up for him, to let other people know what he needs. And that's the way it's always been for humans about non-human animals, because we have this incredible power of words. And of course, when my loved one recovers, he'll have his words back the animals are still going to be counting on us. Now, this is, of course, nothing new. There's a poem that was written back in the late 1800s by uh, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, and part of it goes, I am the voice of the voiceless. Through me, the dumb shall speak till the world's deaf ear will be made to hear the wrongs of the wordless weak. And that sounds so archaic. We don't talk like that anymore. And yet, in many ways, so few things have changed. We can say, oh, we're so much kinder now. How much kinder we are to horses because we drive cars and we have uh, tractors and we have airplanes. So we're not using beasts of burden, at least in this country, nearly to the extent that we were when Ella Wilcox wrote this poem. And yet, in 
the United States and around the world, we're eating more animals than we ever did. And the factory farming way of animal agriculture, which came into play just after World War II, it's sometimes called a CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, is exponentially more cruel than the never great system of raising animals to, to slaughter for, for humans. So here we are today with this beautiful idea of doing unto others as we would like done unto us. Doing unto others as we would like to have done unto our companion animals. So who has a dog, a cat, a bird, somebody that you just love like crazy? And so if anybody wanted to harm this creature that you love, you would come to the fore for them just as if they were trying to harm a human friend or family member. And what this expansion of the golden rule tells us is that we get to do that for all members of living kind. I was at an outdoor cafe last summer and there was an injured pigeon. And oh my goodness, everybody mobilized. All of these women got up from their tables. They left their chicken salad. They were going to the kitchen to get a box. Somebody else was calling it out. Uber, somebody else was calling the wildlife rehab place to make sure that they were open and that they could bring this pigeon to be helped. And once all that was done, they went back to their chicken salads. But that pigeon was, for all intents and purposes, a chicken. And the pig who becomes bacon is pretty much your dog. And the mother whose body makes milk for her precious calf, the cow mother, is not that different if you're a female from the way it was for you when you were making milk for the baby that you loved. So as we think about the golden rule today, it's such an amazing adventure of expansion because anybody who cares about the golden rule is so involved in trying to make things better You've probably got some sort of pet cause or something that just touches your heart and you get up early and you stay up late to try to make things better. Maybe it's literacy, maybe it's equity, maybe it's looking to help people with a certain kind of, of disease or condition, but whatever it is, your whole heart is there. And you might be thinking, I can't add on this too, but you can because you're gonna be eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, no matter in what other ways you're trying to save the world. So have a tofu stir fry or a bean burrito or a Beyond Burger instead of a status quo burger, and then change the world in all these other ways too. It's so beautiful. You might just call it golden. Thank you. Well, Victoria, your words are golden. <laughs> I so appreciate what you shared with us today. Now we're moving on to hear from another uh, excellent speaker who will share some golden words with us. And that is um, Reverend Carol Saunders, who is a freedom loving, truth seeking, consciousness raising, and God centered soul journeyer, author, and podcaster. She hosts and runs the Spiritual Forum. Hello, Carol. Hello, everyone. It's so great to be with you. I was kind of thinking about what am I going to say? And I started planning what I was going to say. And then I had to throw all of it out because I knew that it had to be very organic. And after following Victoria and Silas and Will and Barbara and <laughs> Thomas and, and Vanetta, it's like, what else can I say? Um, so I'm just gonna let spirit speak through me. Um, what I love about the golden rule is it is a principal teaching of all of the world's religions. And what's so cool about that is in this world of division, we're divided about so many things. Here's something we agree with. We agree it, to treat others. We agree that this is a, a standard of morality. This is a law that we believe that if humankind live by this, that we would just have such a better world. 
And it really is a statement about raising up our empathy and our care for each other, all beings and the planet. So I just wanna spend a minute asking everyone to imagine what would the world look like if we all lived by the golden rule? What would it look like? Because I think we have a crisis of imagination. Sometimes I think we just can't imagine. We're just so used to living with the conditioning. We're used to living with normalized violence. We're used to living with war and politicians and all these rules and everything. But what would it look like? Because there's only one real moral law, and that is the golden rule to treat others how you want to be treated, or I actually like the negative better because it's easier to discern. So, so many people don't know how they want to be treated, but people know what they, how they don't want to be treated. So don't treat anyone how you don't want to be treated. So just imagine, because I think we would have a cultural renaissance. I think that our world would be so creative and so filled with love and joy, and our childlike nature would be playing everywhere. And and you know there would be there would be infractions here and there but if overall we live by the golden rule just imagine what that would look like and i think it's really important to be drawn to a vision so one of the things i want to touch on that others have not necessarily touched on is this process of awakening because i know that for some people who are listening this idea of expanding our our circle of compassion to include animals may be new. It may be something that you haven't thought about before, or it may be something that you thought about, but you discarded it quickly because, you know, we are addicted to the animal using business. We're addicted to our meat and our clothes and all the things, all the ways that we use animals. So I just want to invite everyone to consider taking on a prayer. I took this prayer on a couple of years ago because I had a weekly pray for the animals call. And I was starting to feel like I was really living the golden rule. And I wasn't being arrogant about it, but I really felt like, like I had arrived. <laughs> so I decided that, you know, that was probably a little arrogant. And what else, what else am I missing? Because I know there's so much that I'm missing. So the prayer that I took on and whatever it is your religion is, you know, what you call it, God, source, the great mystery, Allah, Buddha, it doesn't matter to me, but whatever that higher self is, that higher creator is, to ask, show me what I cannot yet see. Show me what I cannot yet see. Because when I started that prayer, God showed me all sorts of things that where I was not I was in violation of the golden rule or that I could do better or I could rise, raise up my empathy. I could, I could become a better person. And so I invite you to consider taking on that prayer. A lot of people have talked about veganism as our, our diet three days, uh, three times a day. Um, I want to touch on a few other things that has not been really mentioned because there were some things I was really asleep to for a long time. I became vegetarian at the age of 15, but I wasn't vegan until decades later because I was so asleep to the dairy business. I cannot even believe that I took my children to like the circus and the zoo. These are things that I didn't really think about even though I was a vegetarian, even though I loved animals. Now I'm kind of confessing this because I think we all have some of these things that we're asleep to. And I'm so grateful that I've been shown these ways that I have not treated animals well or people well, because no one wants to be confined. No one wants to be forced to entertain others. And when we look at the zoos and we look at um, the aquariums and we look at the circuses and things like that, this is another way that we are not really living by the golden rule because all of those animals want to be free just as we want to be free and i believe that will talked about the law of compensation or the law of cause and effect as you sow so shall you reap so this is really our key to our own freedom our key to our own living and joy and harmony and and so i just invite you to think about all the ways in your life that you've just been conditioned, just been conditioned. We've conditioned to go to the aquarium and the circus and the zoo and all those kinds of things because our parents took us there. 
And all this conditioning is, you know, we do things, we do things over and over again because we do things over and over again. And this break in um, awareness and this awakening, it can be quite a jolt. It's like, whoa, I didn't know that, I didn't see that. And then, and then what can happen next is a feeling of guilt and shame. And again, I just know that, you know, God will meet you there. Your heart will open. I just need to release all that because you didn't know. And that when we do know better, we do better. And so I think it was uh, St. Paul that said, you know, was, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. Well, now that I'm a grown up, I'm, I'm trying to act in more grown up ways. And grown ups would want to, you know, learn and discern and, and see more of what they cannot see and change their behaviors. Um, there's a few things I wanted to point to. Um, uh the inspirations the inspirations i think uh, lisa asked us to talk about our inspirations and some nuggets and what i'm inspired by is the scripture love one another and also to enter the kingdom you must become as a little child i love that idea because every child wants to be kind to the animals they move in to the animals they move toward the animals they want to pet them love them care for them they're not going at them with a knife and slicing their throats open or anything like that they're not trying to chain them little children know and our inner child knows our inner child knows so to enter the kingdom that kingdom that is of uh, oneness consciousness love for all universal love that we must become as a little child and nurture the child within that we have forgotten for so long so my golden rule heroes i want to close with that anyone who has the courage to awaken from any kind of cultural conditioning because it's hard it's a tough road to to uh, to go down because nobody else is going down there with you so that's the next one anyone who stands in opposition to the majority where the majority is condoning violence the majority is condoning normalizing violence whether it's to a, a child or it's war or it's to animals when you stand in opposition even though the group is is saying hey it's okay that's cool i i don't think there's anything wrong with it I, I, I find that my golden rule heroes are those people who can stand and say, no, no, um, I, I, I don't believe this and I want to do differently. Anyone who uses their voice in a compassionate way to speak truth, and this is hard to do sometimes, to speak truth when in the middle of people, you know, who don't believe in the same way or don't, who are, who are um, harming animals or harming people, to speak truth and to stand up. And anyone who cares for the innocent victims of violence. Um, one of the realizations I just had today is um, like child trafficking is kind of an issue of mine. And it just occurred to me that how we use animals, it's child trafficking. It's the same thing because the animals that we use for our food and our clothing and our entertainment, they are children. They are little children and they are taken from their mothers and they are captured, they are confined, they are put under our rule and they are eventually, you know, killed at a very young age. You know, we're actually eating babies and wearing babies and it is child trafficking. <laughs> so that's my realization today out of my prayer to show me what I cannot yet see. The other thing I wanna invite you to pray for is increased empathy increased empathy. There's so much out there in the media, so much out there in, in the shows that we watch that, that cause us to not feel like, like, like our human self is designed to feel. And so we pray for awakening from what we cannot yet see and also an increased empathy so we can restore ourselves to the human nature that we've been designed image and likeness of God. Um, so those are the thoughts that I have today. A happy golden rule day for everyone. Thank you for having this platform. And thank you all, everybody who's already shared. You're all just so wise. And I know that we're blessing all who are listening. Wow. Well, thank you, Carol, for your incredible words and speaking, uh, channeling almost <laughs> from spirit. We really appreciate that. Next, we have um, Dina Miani Lauman 
who is a vegan pastor, counselor, and creator of The Wellbeing, a community where veganism and faith meet. So she's representing that organization, The Wellbeing. Hi, Dina. Thank you for joining us. You might need to <laughs> Oh, that's right. Unmute. I'm having technical. So I'm going to have to uh, employ the golden rule on myself because just as one o'clock came around, my computer went down. So I apologize if there was some wiggling uh, going on with me as I restored it. Um, but I am thrilled to be here with such a wonderful group of people. And everyone who shared so far is just beautiful and inspiring. And uh, in thinking about what I want to share today, I went back to my childhood. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I remember a particular moment when I was looking at Nina. Nina was my grandma and grandpa's uh, poodle. She was named for me. My name's Dina. So her name was Nina. And she was such an adorable, intelligent, loving dog. She was about medium size. She was a white poodle. So she was one of the first animals I ever loved. I probably got to know her probably around eight, eight years old, nine years old. And Nina spoke to my soul. And I'm so glad, grateful I've had the experience with her. She was my mentor, my teacher, my friend, my family member. And I didn't realize at the time that Nina, and, and also there were three other poodles. There's Josette, I have to mention, Sam and Shaggy. Um, they were in this pack I grew up with, my grandma, my aunt, that they were opening my mind, my heart and my soul to the rich world and the wonderful world of animal, animal sentience and emotional intelligence. Animals, they're just astounding. I just love animals. Their beauty and their wisdom, their divinity and sacredness, their individuality and integrity, and their childlikeness, as Carol pointed out. But there was this one moment in particular, out of many, but someone would call it, you know, have you ever had an aha moment? We probably, I'm sure we all have. Aha. Uh -huh you know, but I had a V8 or whatever. Usually I'm talking spiritual ahas, but I remembered it. Think about it. It must've been significant. It's been about 50 years. So, but I remember I was just casually looking over at Nina and I thought, even though we've never spoken a word, like an English language kind of word together. I mean, I talked to her, uh, she barked it back at me. I just was overwhelmed with the feeling how completely connected I felt to her how completely I felt in communication with her without ever using words like we do as humans. And so this is the start really in some ways of my understanding of what the goal of role means and that it extends to more than the human family. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here that we know that as this group, but sometimes it's just good to be reminded and it's good to be reminded because many people don't believe that it's part of the problem. The golden rule embraces all sentient beings, and I think it embraces the earth herself. It's just a good, great rule. So that's my first gem for the day. Um, the second gem is to point out that even though every day is and should be the golden rule day, it's so awesome to have this special day set aside to lift up this profound and vital rule of living an abundant, healed, and healing and authentic life. Now, the golden rule is a requirement. It's not an option and a menu or living a compassionate and joyful life. And the third gem, that is that the golden rule, and then as a Christian pastor, but I know that in, in the world, the main rule religions, love, loving one another is also a core. Uh, the great commandment, the golden rule, and the great commandment of loving God, while we refer to God and our neighbor as ourselves, and veganism are interwoven. They can, you can't have one without the other. I don't think you can really live out the great commandment or the golden rule unless you have um, a respect for animals and not harming them and being vegan, frankly. And that neighbor that we're called to love is not limited to a human neighbor, but to every neighbor, to every sentient being from from the tiniest little ladybug or to that spider. I know we all kind of usher, we take care of the spiders in our houses 
to the biggest elephant and the whale. And the leader was brought up the other day, hearing her. And to everyone in between, including the cosmos. It's just a joyous existence that God created. And, and Jesus, he calls us even to love our enemies. Now, that is a tall order. But he really doesn't make any exceptions either. He says, doesn't say, well, this or whatever. So the golden world is about honoring the divinity, sacredness, and sanctity of life. And one of my favorite songs, the God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale, there's a line that asks, how does the creature say awe? How does the creature say praise? And that's a question for us too. How do we say awe and praise to God? I think we do it through the golden world. We stand be before, together before it all in what Prince called this thing called life, dealing with the joys and the challenges together, striving to treat each other as we'd like to be treated, that's the real wisdom. And it's good for us too. The golden rule is super good for us. My Aunt Kay, my beloved Aunt Kay used to say, what you give out in the world comes back to you somehow, some way. And it comes back to you tenfold. And as a pastor, I'm reminded that God created a vegan world. And as a counselor, I'm reminded of how hard emotionally it can be to be vegan. So we need to take care of ourselves and one another and remember that what we do, what we think and we say matters very much. Whether we're on a world stage or whether we're whis um, whispering to one another quietly, whether it's a big announcement or a quick hello, it all matters. As faith-based vegans, we represent our faith and veganism and how we navigate life makes a difference especially to the animals. Now, is this easy? I was, we'd all be doing it, right? The world would be really different. It's not always easy, it can be. It's often quite challenging, but it is always, always, always worth it. The golden rule is not just a nice thing to do. The rule, golden rule comes from God, our creator, from, from, from God. And it's the keeps that unlocks the way to how we are to live our lives. The very key. It needs to be centered to our lives too in our world. What a world would be, huh? But we're working on it. We're working on it. And I have to close. I'm going to dedicate my reflection with thankfulness to Nina, Joe, Sam, and Shaggy, who are just beyond the rainbow birds. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for bringing your sweet um, animal companions into our our circle today it's really wonderful and next we do have frank lane who is the author of plant powered enlightenment claiming animal liberation is human liberation hi frank hi it's a pleasure to be here Wow, what an esteem group. You are all my favorite animals. And I, and I truly mean that because we are animals and our animal nature is something that if we can get behind, if we can understand, then we can really have that relationship with all the animals that we share this beautiful planet with. I think that as I had just said that animal liberation is truly human animal liberation. When we see ourselves as animals, we can then liber liberate ourselves to the freedom that this incredible planet has given us. And secondly, and these are my, what I call my golden rules after 50 years of veganism, these are the different nuggets, the gems that I've come up with. And the second is that spiritual intelligence is causing no harm to people, animals, and the planet. That's what spiritual intelligence is. And thirdly, I would like to acknowledge all the authors and all the people that put forth the information about veganism because I know you have distillated literally decades of time into that manuscript or into that speech. 
and that is dynamic. When you can take all your wisdom and put it into that gem, that's an amazing experience. So I want to honor everyone for doing that in their own way. What what an amazing uh, what an amazing transition of taking all that information and putting it into our heart and giving it out into the world. That's just fantastic. The third Nick uh, nugget is meditation. Is that I have really come to understand that the human body and the animal body is actually the fulcrum, the point in between two infinities, the infinity of space and the infinity within us. We are at the center point between the infinity of space and the infinity in our own consciousness. And fifth, is that our spiritual ascension happens when we vibrate at the highest level that we possibly can. And how we vibrate is what we take into our being. What we consume, we become. And what we consume, when we consume a high energy, whether it be plant-based or the poetry that we read or the things that we watch, but whatever we take in, we become, and we vibrate at that level. Um, and six is vegans strive to be kindly present. It's our nature as vegans to accentuate our kindness in the ever-present moment. And lastly, I would like to um recite a quote by son of gentle world and she said being vegan empowers me right here and now to be every change i wish to see in the world using plant powered light thank you for letting me share I love that image of plant-powered light. Thank you so much, Frank. Well, now I actually have the opportunity to introduce myself because I'm the, the final speaker today. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Lisa Levinson and I am the campaigns director for In Defense of Animals, a founder of Vegan Spirituality, which explores veganism, as a spiritual practice and co-founder of the Interfaith Vegan Coalition. So it's my pleasure today to share a couple of gems of the golden rule with you. The golden rule inspires me to consider how my actions impact everyone around me. And as others have mentioned earlier, everyone for me includes the animals, all the animals, <laughs> the human ones and the non-human ones. So when I make choices every day, I think about what are the consequences of my actions and how will they impact others? How will they affect animals and the environment down the line? So my individual consumer choices can either bring more joy and ease or more stress and suffering. What I choose to eat or wear or purchase. So as we know from folks sharing earlier, the vegan plant-based options is one way that we can choose compassion for three meals a day. And there's also other ways. So perhaps if you're thinking of, well, I'm gonna put on a coat or I'm gonna buy this coat, maybe a faux leather coat instead of one that is made of animal skins. Or if you're putting on makeup or applying skin products, trying cruelty-free cosmetics that are not tested on animals. 
many of the products have little symbols on there of a leaping bunny. So you know that those are not tested on animals. And that's one way, a small way that we can choose compassion every day and, and live out the golden rule in our actions as well as in our thoughts. I know Reverend Carol mentioned forms of entertainment like the circus. We also have marine parks and Dina mentioned, I believe that um, Lolita, the, the orca who um, was in prison for over 50 years now has an opportunity to join her, her family again from all of the activism that's been done for years and by people who are present with us today. That's one example of a type of entertainment that enslaves others. And more recently, I've been um, advocating to stop wild hog bagging contests where people um, actually enjoy watching animals uh, struggle and suffer who have been trapped and then are desperately trying to escape and in so doing, they injure themselves and then people on top of that injure them as well by stuffing them into large bags on top of one another. So these, these images of fun, there are whole festivals devoted to this. Um, people bring their children to these events. And this is another way that we can really consider the golden rule in our actions. What does this form of entertainment do down the line? How does it impact these animals? What is happening to them emotionally, physically, and spiritually? And something you may not think about is when people complain about goose poop in the park, down the line, how will officials resolve this problem? Well, behind the scenes, they may trap and kill these animals and you won't see them any longer, perhaps wondering if they've flown off for the winter. But in reality, they've suffered a very cruel and painful death. Meanwhile, there are non-lethal methods like habitat modification that actually really uh, help more than, than the act of killing them. So sometimes these compassionate choices are also the most effective choices. So my top gem, <laughs> For today is that the golden rule reminds me to practice ahimsa, which is a Sanskrit word that means to do the least amount of harm to all living beings. So may all of our choices do the least amount of harm for, for everyone, including animals in that circle of compassion. So I want to thank everyone for being here with us today, for hearing our gems, and for, for joining us in this exploration of living the golden rule today and every day. So thank you so much to everyone. Wanted to offer a moment if we have just a question or two, if anyone would like to either put a question in the chat box or into the Q&A if you're with us on the Zoom. And we're receiving some thanks from people who are joining here with us. And also we have a person here who's uh, working on a special project called the Let's see, it is the post-animal use world, the PAW project, which is another effort to embrace the golden rule through veganism and compassion for all animals. So with that, I think we'll take a moment to thank the Charter for Compassion for this wonderful opportunity to celebrate compassion for all animals for Golden Rule Day together with all of you. We're very grateful to be here and to, to celebrate together. Thank you, Charter, and thank you, Felipe. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you, everybody else that participated on this panel with all your inspiring words and experiences. 
Um, we, as I, and as I told you before, we're grateful for your con yearly contributions to Golden Rule Day and for sharing something so important that is compassion to all animals. Thank you once again for joining us and we'll see you soon. Happy Golden Rule Day. Thank <laughs> you. Mm -hmm.